And uh, this afternoon, we are very happy to have with us Associate Professor Jacqueline Bloomfield, who is the Director of Offshore Program, and she looks after our program here at SIM. So uh, without further ado, let me invite Jacqueline to uh, start the webinar. Jacqueline, please. Thank you, Celine, and good afternoon to everyone who has joined us today. I am speaking to you from sunny Sydney, and the image that you can see on the title slide is basically what I can see at the moment out the window as I speak to you. So that might just help put you into the context of where I am. Okay, so I am very pleased to be um, speaking with you this afternoon. And what I'm going to be doing in this session is delivering a talk about higher education and patient outcomes. And I hope that you will find this interesting and of relevance to yourself. I'm also going to be providing some information about the 2021 Nursing Studies Support Fund that we initiated and answering questions about the Bachelor of Nursing post-registration degree. And I believe that you'll also be speaking to one of our alumni, um, May, who graduated from um, Sydney Nursing School at the University of Sydney a couple of years ago. And she has a very exciting career that she can talk to you about. So I hope that that sounds fine with everyone. Just a little bit about me. As um, Celine said, my name is Jacqueline Bloomfield and I'm an associate professor here at the University of Sydney in the nursing school. I'm a registered nurse and I'm also a midwife. And um, my clinical specialty is uh, hematology, oncology and palliative care. And I worked for a very long time in a bone marrow transplant unit. Um, I have a lot of degrees and qualifications and I've been working as a university academic now for over 20 years. So I've developed expertise in nursing education and I've worked at universities in Singapore, in the UK and Australia. I tend to do a lot of writing. So some of you may have seen some of the books or journal articles that I have written. And um, the most rewarding aspect of my role is my job as the director of our programs in Singapore. And I love coming to Singapore when there's not a pandemic and travel restrictions. Okay, so let's just set the scene for what I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon. And you are probably already aware of these facts, but do you know that there's almost 28 million nurses worldwide and they account for almost 60% of the entire healthcare workforce. So nurses represent a very important component of healthcare. Nurses deliver approximately 90% of primary healthcare services internationally. So not all nurses work in hospitals, as you know, and I know that not all of you will be working in a hospital, and that is going to increase in the future as primary health increases. But nurses, regardless of where they're working, are facing an increasing amount of challenges and working with complexity. And to add on to that, there's also currently a global shortage of nurses. And it's estimated that that is going to get worse over the next decade. So nurses are very valuable resources. And we need to make sure that we look after them well, educate them well, and then um, retain them within the, the healthcare workforce. So I'm going to be presenting a bit of a debate or a question, and some of you will already have quite strong views on this. And it's been a question that has been in existence for a couple of decades, really. And that is, do nurses need to be degree level educated or not? And just to make sure that everyone understands what I mean by a degree, it's a qualification awarded to students upon successful completion of a course of study in higher education. And that's usually undertaken at a university or a college. 
And most undergraduate nursing degrees are called bachelor's degrees. So it will be, for example, a bachelor of nursing or bachelor of nursing post-registration. So let's have a think about this question, do nurses need degrees? And a survey was done recently among some nurses and the question was asked, um, is this debate about the need for nurses to hold degrees evidence of a general lack of understanding or ignorance about what nurses actually do? And 75% of the nurses answered, yes, it is. It's really just a, you know, a secondary argument. The reason why this question keeps coming up is because people don't know what nurses actually do. And I think that's a very important point that I'm going to be talking a little bit about. So if nurses don't, if the public doesn't know what nurses actually do, when, then what are the public's perceptions of nursing? What do the public think of nurses? And this has some really interesting history associated with it. And a lot of perceptions come out of imagery and images. I'm just going to show you some historical images of nursing. And these are really quite beautiful. This is my favorite one. And I have this framed in, um, on my office wall at home. But this is a nurse from, I guess, the uh, Victorian, Edwardian times, and we can tell because of the uniform that she's wearing. But if you look at that, it's very, very symbolic. And some things that we can take from that image is the white apron that she's wearing. And that's very symbolic of being angelic or angel-like, saint-like qualities. The other thing that we can see from this is that she's a female. Okay, so many public perceptions of nursing came from historical imagery. Let's have a look at another one. This is another beautiful image here. And this depicts a nurse in the war, the First World War, working on the battlefields. And look at the symbolism in this picture as well. It's a very muddy battlefield, the soldiers are injured, yet here's this nurse in pristine white, again looking very saintly and angelic, putting her hand on the shoulder of an injured um, soldier and she's carrying a baby. So again, what sort of message is that sending? And this image is called the comforter and um, that feeds very strongly into what many people think nurses do. And that's just to comfort patients. And that's about it. So these things are important. There is some accuracy to them, but nursing goes well beyond that, as you will know. So those early images actually have resulted in the um, creation of what we call nursing stereotypes. Now, a stereotype is a widely held and fixed, but often distorted or oversimplified image or idea of a particular type of person or a thing. And if we think about nursing stereotypes, there are several very strong stereotypes that exist. And I have already alluded to some of those. So the first is that all nurses are female, and we know that that's not true. Let's have a look at some of the other ones. The battle axe. Now, when I say the word battle axe, I mean, um, it sort of means um, old hag, okay? Now, this stereotype is quite evident in the media, so in, and in popular fiction, and this portrays the image of an usually an overweight authoritarian senior nurse who struts around the wards with an air of self-importance, making junior nurses cry, making their life as tough as she can. The patients are also quite scared of the battle axe nurse. 
and um, as I said, often appears in television, situational comedies and films, particularly last century. So um, I guess really from the 1960s through to, well, we still see it now, but mainly the 1960s, 70s and 80s. So the battle axe nurse is renowned for bullying junior nurses, usually depicted or always depicted as a female, usually single, middle-aged, and has come up through the ranks herself, it got to the top of the tree, and now spends her time making um, younger nurses' lives miserable. And maybe you know a battle axe type nurse. I know when I was working in a hospital, there are a few around. Another very common stereotype of nursing is the naughty nurse or the sexy nurse. And this portrays nurses as being really dumb, bimbos who are only focused on pleasing male patients and doctors. Um, so the nurse is depicted as a sex symbol or a nymphomaniac, usually wearing a very short, tight, revealing uniform. Um, also often yielding a syringe or a needle. And this really originates from hundreds of years ago when nursing was one of the lowest jobs a woman can, could get. And it was reserved for those at the very, very bottom of society who engaged in debauchery and all sorts of immoral types of activity. So that's the naughty nurse. And we still see the naughty nurse image today. Um, you can see it in the way some people dress up, um, costumes, advertising, and it's actually very offensive to nurses who you know, are trying to portray a professional image. Next image is the doctor's handmaiden. And this one, is well outdated but still exists in some countries today. So again this idea that the nurse is always female but seen as being very subservient to doctors who are powerful. Doctors are the boss, the nurses do whatever they say and run after the doctor like a handmaiden. So they're at the doctor's beck and call. So this is portraying the nurse as being weaker, less objective, and a less skilled appendage of the medical profession. And if there's any type of trouble, including personal problems, the nurse would always turn to the strong doctor to help. Now, probably the most common one is this, the nurses as angels. So I talked very briefly about this to begin with, and this, image depicts nurses as saints, always dressed in white, always virtuous, usually depicted as being very pretty. Um, it was promoted mainly in the 19th century around the time of Florence Nightingale and nurses were depicted in these types of images as being moral, noble, uh, religious, almost nun-like and nursing was seen as a calling, okay, rather than a profession or a chosen career. It was a vocation. And the nurse was illustrated or depicted as being um, very selfless and self-sacrificing. So I'm wondering what people think of those types of images and whether they still exist today. That's a bit of food for thought. Now you might be saying why is she going on about pictures and images of nurses and that's because they are very important. Images are often perpetuated through the media and the public get a lot of their information from the media and images and perceptions are important because they reflect societal value of nurses in the nursing profession. And if they're wrong, they can engender and enhance um, myths and misconceptions. 
So positive images can enhance the confidence of patients and clients, their families in nursing by providing an impression of nurses being trustworthy and competent. But if they're not depicted as such, it can have grave implications and can lead to a misunderstanding about what nurses do. And the way that the public perceives nursing influences directly recruitment and job satisfaction. So next time you see an inaccurate depiction of a nurse, have a think about what the implications of that might be. And I wrote an article in my very early days as a nurse academic about um, stereotypes and misconceptions. And I've just taken this little passage from it. Uh, frequent misrepresentations of nurses on television and in the media can have serious consequences, not only for nurses in that their work is often unfairly underestimated, but also for patients who may gain unrealistic expectations from watching media portrayals of nursing. So keep in mind that the media has a very strong influence on public views and offensive stereotypes can lead to the public overlooking the importance of nurses within healthcare. And that can generate a lack of respect, a lack of trust, and ignorance about the role of nurses. I'm going to put these images up because these are much more recent. In fact, these are current images that we are seeing depicted in the media. So COVID-19, the global pandemic that has had an impact on all of our lives, has really pushed nurses into the spotlight. And it was quite ironic that this occurred in 2020, which was the International Year of the Nurse. So nursing got a lot of public recognition. So nurses became highly visible in the media for their role within the pandemic. And we are still in the middle of that pandemic, or I don't know if it's the middle or not, but we are still experiencing the pandemic. And nurses are highly visible in their roles. So they're working in testing stations, in quarantine facilities, they're responding to workforce nursing shortages by working extra shifts. They're caring for critically ill patients. They're now working in vaccination clinics. And the media has perpetuated again these ideas of nurses as either angels or heroes. Okay, And these are very familiar. You will have seen some images like this, I'm sure either on advertising or in the newspaper or social media. And well, these can be perceived as being complimentary and you know, the intent is not to be negative. The intent is to be positive. They are actually very harmful to nursing. I wonder if anyone's ever thought about that. When your friend said, oh, you're wonderful. You must be an angel to be a nurse or you see posters with nurses in Superman, superwomen capes, you know, your heroes. Actually, let's have a think about what these images are actually doing. Are nurses really angelic? Are nurses heroes? Yes, they have done some very, very courageous things over the last 12 to 18 months. There is no de denying that, but they're doing their job. And perpetuating these types of images undermines professionalism and creates, and this is really important, creates a perception that nurses' skills, their knowledge, their education, and their discipline are unimportant. Because these nurses have these superhuman traits, which just must come. They're not attributes that are hard earned and have taken years of study and years of experience. So depicting nurses as superhuman, whether that be as heroes or as angels, can be quite dangerous. And I'm not saying that this is intentional, but we have to think beyond the superficial image. 
I think depicting the nurse as an angel is probably the most damaging one. Remember we saw nurses depicted as angels a couple of hundred years ago, and that was reinforcing this feminized, gendered workforce, that nursing is the role of women, that it's a female occupation, and that nurses are selfless and self-effacing. And how is the public going to perceive nurses asking for increases in their wages or better working conditions if they have the idea that nurses are angels and they're self selfless? Okay, so this also is reinforcing historical stereotypes. I'm going to show you another image now, and this is a beautiful image. This, I don't know if anyone has seen this, but this was drawn by a British street artist named Banksy. And he's well known in the UK for going around in secret and drawing these images on the side of public buildings. And they often appear overnight. And this one came up on, a, on the side of a building. And he was portraying nurses as being superheroes or superhuman. You can see that. The child has chosen a toy out of a basket of Batman and Spider-Man, but he chose the super nurse, complete with her cape. Okay. This again is reinforcing that stereotype. And the president of the British Association of Critical Care Nurses voiced her concern about this image. And while she acknowledged that it was beautiful and well-intended, this is what she said. We are not angels. We are not he heroes. We are human beings that have chosen a career. We are highly educated. We work in a patient safety critical profession. We simply want to go to the job and go to work and do the job we were trained to do. So that's a little bit about public perception and nurses. And remember my, the question I'm debating is, do nurses need degrees? So I'm talking a little bit about public image and public perception and how powerful stereotypes can be. Now there's a public perception that caring and education are not aligned. In fact, many people believe that you can't be caring and intelligent at the same time. Okay, we know that's not true, but many people think that these traits or these attributes or these qualities are at opposite ends of the spectrum or the continuum. So if you're caring, if you're compassionate, if you are kind, you can't possibly have the ability to critically think. It doesn't go hand in hand with education or intelligence or clinical judgment. We know that that's not true, but that's not what is commonly perceived by the public. And that's why many People in the public believe that nurses do not need degrees. Now in Australia, nursing has been a degree-based profession for the best part of 30 years. In the UK, it came in as a degree-based profession in 2013. In Singapore, it's still a diploma-based profession. And I mean that that's the baseline qualification that's needed. And I was living in the UK when there was a lot of debate around whether to introduce a degree or not. So I have looked back at some of my um, readings and things and chosen a few for you that you may have heard similar things in Singapore. So this was a reader who was commenting on a BBC News story. And this reader said, if nurses needed a degree, then they'll get ideas above their station and expect something quite different from the job. It is a job that requires quite different qualifications and attitudes to the academic. It should be on par with an electrician or a plumber or carpenter. 
a highly skilled job that requires vocational, not academic training. Government likes the idea of academic nurses in order to get second line doctors on the cheap, but for patient care, it's completely negative and must be opposed. So that was one member of the public's viewpoint. And here's another one that wrote in. Florence Nightingale did not take a degree course. I believe that nurses are born, not created. I have been in hospital many times in my life and the best ones have always been those that do the job because it's in their blood and heart. You can educate someone to the nth degree, but you cannot teach them to care or common sense. This is something that is quite often lacking in graduates until they have some, had some experience of life. I wonder what you think about those ideas. I wonder if you've heard similar things from people you may have talked about regarding nurses and degrees. And I remember I was in a taxi once in Sydney and I always talk to the taxi drivers because I find that you learn so much about other people's lives. So I generally engage in chit chat. And he was asking me about something and I told him that I had a PhD and he said, what are you? And I said, oh, my PhD is in nursing. And I think he almost drove off the side of the road. He was so surprised. And he said, a PhD in nursing. But all I thought was that nurses took temperatures and gave patients cups of tea. And that wasn't that long ago that I had that experience. So there is still this very um, widespread lack of understanding of what nurses do. So you can see here, I'm now leading up to, well, we've got this big, you know, perception that nurses don't need degrees. Well, what's the counter argument? Why do they need degrees if it's all in the heart? And care and intelligence are two separate things that can never be united. Let's have a look at the other side of the argument. So nurses are at the forefront of healthcare delivery. We know that and we've seen that over the past 18 months with COVID. They play an integral role in patient care, regardless of whether this is in the hospital or community setting. We've learnt today that nurses comprise over 60% of the healthcare workforce. Nurses don't only require a deep understanding of a broad range of issues related to health and illness. For example, anatomy and physiology, how the body works, pharmacology, pathophysiology, so how medications work, what diseases are, how they manifest, also sociology and psychology. But they also require knowledge of evidence-based practice, research, leadership, and legal and ethical issues. This is what nursing's about in contemporary society. This is what nurses need to know. As the delivery of healthcare changes in a very rapid pace, now we need to look and think, well, how can we best continue to prepare our nurses for the future and for their role that is getting increasingly complex and challenging? And here's some little points that I put that I just thought might be useful for you to think about and reflect on. So nurses should have the ability to think critically and to question respectfully when they believe that there could be a better treatment. And that's what we call critical thinking and clinical judgment. And nurses every day, regardless of where they work, are making judgments. And education helps that. We could say, well, you don't hear people questioning why doctors need to go to university or dietitians need to go to university or physiotherapists need to go to university to get degrees. Why then is this debate perpetuatingly carrying on about nurses and degrees and going to university? And some people may have heard the idea that nursing is both a science and an art, okay? And some people believe you can learn the science, but you can't learn the art. 
I don't believe that. Nursing is a science, but what has happened to the art of nursing? Well, they go hand in hand. And if we think about that continuum, the care, the kindness, the compassion, the smarts, the intelligent, the knowing how things work, we could say that's the art and science of nursing. And a good nurse has both of those. A counter argument to people who think that nursing is just about caring. Okay, I really like this um, extract that was taken from an author called Crib. And she said, caring is not some warm, wishy-washy feeling, but it's an exacting and demanding set of skills which exercise our judgment, including our emotional judgment. It's a form of know-how that admits degree of expertise and is developed through practice and experience as well as reflection. To be a caring person is not an alternative to being an intelligent person. It is necessarily an exercise of intelligence. So have a think about that one. That's saying to be, intel to be caring, you actually need to be intelligent because there's this, you know, judgment involved and emotional intelligence and interpersonal intelligence. And if some of you choose to study for your degree, you'll learn about different ways of knowing in nursing and a very famous theorist called CARPA. Okay. So as a nurse with a degree, I've been taught to look at the evidence. So what's the evidence that nurses need degrees or that nurses and degrees are aligned? Well, there's some seminal evidence out there and I've just got a few examples on my slide, but the literature is getting um, more populated with studies that are showing that patient outcomes are better when they're cared for by nurses with degrees. So Aitken and colleagues in 2014 published a, a landmark, groundbreaking piece of research in the medical journal, The Lancet. And that shows how important this study was. And she and her colleagues did a study involving 11 hospitals in Europe and I think it was something like over 13,000 patients looking at their outcomes and um, looking at what the educational level of the nurses who cared for them. And these researchers found that there was a 10% increase, sorry, they found that when the nursing skill mix, so think about registered nurses and um, other nurses who didn't have degrees, were in a skill mix. When that skill mix increased by 10% of bachelor educated nurses, there was a 7% reduction in 30 day patient inpatient mortality. So patient deaths fell by 30% within 30 days of them being patients. Okay, you might think 7%, that's not a lot. That's seven in a hundred people, lives were saved. Legan did a, another study, this was a bit earlier, and found that hospitals with a higher percentage of registered nurses who had a baccalaureate or higher degree, those, Hospitals had lower levels of things like congestive heart failure deaths, ulcers, failure to rescue. So that means failure to see signs of a deteriorating patient and a much lower level of post-operative um, complications such as DVT and pulmonary embolus. You might be thinking, well, they're European or American hospitals. What about in Asia? A Korean study found that each 10% increase in nurses having a degree is associated with a 9% decrease in patient deaths. Okay, so think about what a degree equips nurses with. And I'm not saying, and please no one misunderstand, I'm not saying that nurses who don't have degrees are not good nurses. I'm not saying that. But what the evidence is telling us is that there seems to be a difference 
And that difference is reflected in better patient outcomes when nurses have degrees. And I would put that back to them being more prepared to be critical thinkers and to make clinical judgments. Okay, so um, it's not just in surgical nursing either. A study by Kidney Lee and Aitken, again, Linda Aitken, who did the seminal study, found that better nursing staff levels and higher educational levels of nurses mitigated poor patient outcomes among highly vulnerable patients with serious mental illness. So we're talking about the mental health setting here now. And more recently, a literature review of 13 recent reported studies found that mortality, failure to rescue and readmission rates all decrease as the proportion of degree level educated nurses increases. So the evidence is there. So are we getting, are people starting to perhaps maybe change their ideas about whether nurses need a degree or not, or whether it would be advantageous? Here's another quote. If nurses are to deal effectively with complex change, increased demands and greater accountability, they must become skilled in higher level thinking and reasoning abilities. And that's what a degree prepares people for. So I think I've talked to you and probably planted some seeds in your minds. So I'm going to leave you with this question. And I have done a little bit of a wordplay with Shakespeare. To degree or not to degree, that is the question, okay? So <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. Okay. The Bachelor of Nursing post-registration course is a degree course designed specifically for registered nurses in Singapore who have a certificate or diploma level qualification who want to upgrade to a bachelor's level degree. This is absolutely for nurses who wish to enhance their nursing knowledge, practice and skills and further their career. This course equipped me with an inquisitive mind and critical thinking skills that is a valuable asset to me. Nurses provide the largest amount of care for patients and therefore need to be able to provide the best care. It provides the opportunity for them to learn more about research and evidence-based practice and current challenges in the nursing profession from both a global and local perspective. So anyone serious about advancing their career and becoming a future nursing leader should do this course. There are a few reasons I choose this program. First, our University of Sydney has an international reputation for its outstanding teaching and research excellence. The second reason is that this program is accredited by Singapore Nursing Board. This course is unique because it's taught by Sydney University academics who are experts in their field. All teachers come from the Sydney Nursing School to teach face-to-face -face here in Singapore, including myself. So that allows students to be taught by academics from one of the world's top-rated nursing schools. This course is definitely flexible because it's taught in block mode and also with online support. The ability to teach in Singapore, I feel, is a privilege. It's absolutely fantastic. The students are enthusiastic. They're willing to learn. There are a few areas that we can explore after finish this degree. The first, you can look up in the math journal. The second is that you can use the knowledge you gain here, can pursue the honor program, then gain the further requirement to enter MBA program. The Bachelor of Nursing Honours Program is available for high achieving graduates who wish to further develop their research knowledge and skills. To fit this study program into my personal life and work schedule can be challenging at times, but you cannot expect a rainbow without a little rain. As healthcare is an ever-changing arena, nurses are required to keep our clinical knowledge updated and continue with professional education courses. It also involves about leadership, management, law and healthcare reform. So this course will definitely provide our nursing students with the versatility essential to remain competitive in this dynamic healthcare industry. After this rigorous academic journey, you'll feel that it's worthwhile that you have completed it. 
Over these two years, I've gained valuable knowledge that helped me through my clinical practice as a registered nurse. So come join us. You know, you'll see a difference in yourself as a graduate with Sydney Nursing School. Okay, um, I hope you enjoyed that video. So now I'm just going to call on May to uh, do a sharing. May, please. Hi, hi, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, Dr. Jacqueline, uh, nice seeing you again. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Aline. Uh, yeah, and also thanks uh, SIM for giving me this opportunity today to speak to um, our future, future leaders in, in nursing. Um, I think we have about like about 10. 10 on the on, on today's talk yeah so um okay I, I don't have any slide I'll just um, run through uh, verbally to share just some of my experience so uh, I think um I think uh, there, there might have been some introduction or you might have seen some poster on Facebook uh, so my name is uh, May you can just call me May and I am um I actually graduated from Miam Poly in 2011. Uh, and then from SIM in 2017. So uh, since since I become a registered nurse in uh, Singapore, uh, I've been working, I, I was working in NUH uh, ICU for about um, eight years. And then uh, now currently I'm working in community setting. So I'm, I'm with uh, this uh, welfare organization called Meta Welfare Association. So we have this uh, one department that's uh, looking after community services so uh, basically there is a, a day rehab center and then there is also a home-based part of the program where we see elderly and patients in their home to look after them in the um, in terms of chronic disease management in terms of uh, palliative aspect so the, the main aim is to um, allow these uh, elderly or even younger ones to age in place and then also um, stay, in, stay at home and uh, to keep them away from hospital as much as possible. So yeah, that's, that's just a brief intro about my job scope and my background. So, um, okay, uh, I think some of you might be wondering, okay, what, what, was, what was it like to study in, um, in SIM? I think some of you would have heard from uh, your, your friends or your seniors that, okay, SIM nursing is not easy. Yeah, so, so that's, that's very true. It's, uh, it's not designed to uh, make you pass easily because um, I, I, I believe uh, uh, University of Sydney value the quality of education. So I, 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 I really enjoyed uh, uh, the talk just now by Dr. Jacqueline talking about nursing and the issue in nursing in a global context. So I think these, these are some of the issues that we'll be discussing in, in depth during this uh, two years course. So there are, there are eight modules, uh, I, I ran through eight modules and, and to summarize what, were my, what was my experience in uh, two years in SIM University of Sydney is that uh, there was not even a day that I dragged myself to class or to even tutorial. So I really enjoy um, all of the lectures and tutor, tutor, tutorials, yeah. So uh, the, the, my favorite part is that, um, that there's this uh, consistency because we get the lecturer and the tutor who are the same person from University of Sydney. So um, back in my time, right, uh, the other, other degree were running like, okay, to lecturer come once, once a while, to do one day lecture and then there'll be tutor that is from local local hospital or local tutor. So um, for, for University of Sydney, the, the, my favorite part is that I get to see my lecturer and my tutor for that two good weeks of time. And then I get to continue with them for tutor. Even though they are not in Singapore after the, uh, after the study period, I can still contact them through email. So that was really, really helpful for me. And um, there's also my uh, another part that I like about is that um, after, uh, before or, or before every tutor, tu tutorial or lecture, right, I can actually book with my uh, tutor lectures uh, to discuss about things uh, that is related to the unit of study and also about career advice. So th those are very, very helpful and uh, I enjoy the time with the lectures. Yeah. So, uh, and then... Uh, the other helpful thing in the course structure is that um, every unit of study will we will, we will always get uh, in advance uh, there will be a so-called a, a 
package of things that you will you will receive where you are given essential reading lists including the reading articles so those are actually like um uh, building you up before the lecture event starts so uh that, that was very very helpful when i went to lecture after i read all those and when i went to lecture i i was able to communicate and discuss and sometimes debate with the lecturers uh, lecturers during the lecture itself so that actually broadened my understanding and my my thinking in nursing issue yeah um and then um so because of this course right and and there are different aspect of uh there are actually eight different modules that's really designed to um help you become better nurses and better leaders in, in nursing in the future so um every every module is designed specifically to make you learn more and uh, assignments are actually quite interesting and uh it's not a I didn't I didn't find it as a as a chore or as a boring thing when when I had to do um assignments. So one of the assignments that I I did back then was uh to interview a leader. Uh that, that was under nursing management and then you you write an essay about that. Or the other module is uh like you you the assignment itself is that you have to write a letter to an uh to a friend uh who is in nursing and and discuss about why you think uh, nursing is an important discipline. So, so those are very uh, unique way of uh, making, making you learn and also uh, understand things better in nursing. Yeah. And the other thing is that uh, I, I feel very privileged to have studied in uh, University of Sydney because um, uh, th the main thing is that uh, in the course structure itself and the module that's designed, right, um, they are very, I would say more um, in, in local language would be, I would say it's atas because uh, in, um, if you compare to other courses with my, with other colleagues, right, I realized that the, the, the assignment and the module or the course, uh, coursework that we have to submit, right, is uh, slightly more advanced. Uh, example, like we have to submit research proposal. In other courses, they are just doing uh, critique for one article. So that really uh, uh, boosts up our confidence in when, when I go back to work also. And uh, there was this last module about integrated review. So integrated review is more of like for some other degree, it's, it's more for like master's level, but it was already, I have already gone through it in the degree level. So that's very, very beneficial for me. So um, also a little bit about myself when I, when I was in ICU and I was studying in SIM, I wasn't too sure whether um what was the career choice that i want to make uh, even though i know it's nursing nursing is very very broad uh, you you can pick up any anything under nursing as long as you have the you have the passion for it so um it was through this course i have uh, gone through community uh, nursing course um that's where i pick up that okay there's really a lot in community and that's why i wanted to try community nursing and i i really enjoy it now so I, I must thank to um, the lecturers from uh, University of Sydney as well for giving me this, um, this direction and uh, kind of light so that I can, I can choose what is the future path that I want to go to. Yeah. So a um, little tip for, some tips for if you're considering to take up this course. So first thing is that you have to make your time to do some reading. Uh, just for this two year, um, after the two year, you, your your journey will be much smoother. But uh, for this two year, you have to spend time to do reading, and uh, of course, time is uh also precious. So when uh, most of us are working part time, so we really have to plan our time to to do our coursework to make sure that we we take as much as possible from this course. Yeah, and um. And, and enjoy learn, learning not just for the sake of passing just enjoy learning and you will reach you will reach the passing mark if you are enjoy if you are enjoying learning passing come very easy yeah you don't have to struggle to make the make the mark to pass the the exam yeah um and uh last point is that healthcare is uh, ever changing and you would have seen in the past even in the past two years 
uh, healthcare has changed a lot and also in nursing. And there are really a lot of issues that's coming up and there are a lot more work for nurses to, to take up and then to explore. So uh, we need to we need to have foundation, which which is uh, which something that you can gain from this University of Sydney uh, nursing study, and by having this degree, uh, it will really prepare you uh, to face whatever that's in the future in healthcare and nursing. And don't forget, uh, uh, you, all of you will become leader one day. So these are the very foundation, very bare minimum that you I, I would I would suggest that you acquire now. Yeah. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Jacqueline again for giving me the chance uh, and, and having a good experience of uh, uh, lecture and studies with you in University of Sydney and also SIM for, for this uh, experience to share with uh, the rest of the students. Yeah. Thank you, Ray. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I'd like to uh, perhaps open up the uh, session now to the floor to uh, take any questions from anyone. So please feel free to direct your questions either to Jacqueline, myself, or to May. Um, thank you, May. I'm very proud of you, as I am all the graduates from the University of Sydney who have done the degree course. And as you were speaking, I was thinking, I would give you a high distinction for that presentation. It started off really well and you concluded very well and the body of your talk was full of very good examples. So thank you, May. Thank you. Celine, do we have any questions coming into the chat box? Uh, yes, I've just seen one that has just been uh, posted. Maybe I could just read it out, Jacqueline. Um, yes. There's a question that came in. So what are the main differences between the local and the uh, University of Sydney degree, if any? Yeah. So I think I... that's probably asking for a comparison with uh, the NUS degree. Okay, that's a very good question, whoever's asked that one. And I could probably talk about the University of Sydney's reputation. And that's a, a big um, point of differentiation. So the University of Sydney is one of the top universities in the world, and it is recognized globally as being one of the top universities. I think in the last um, university rankings, it came within the top 50. The other thing is that nursing, um, is in the top 12 nursing schools in the world. And I'm not sure that all of the local schools are on par with that. Um, so that's a big difference. Um, University of Sydney degree is recognised worldwide. So I know there's a little bit of a misperception that your degree, if you do it from the University of Sydney, it won't be recognised in Singapore or in other countries. That's absolutely not true. It is, and it, it's currency. Um, you have a degree from the University of Sydney and it will take you places. And I think May is demonstrating that to us this afternoon with the rapid advancements in her career. So I hope that one answers your, your question. I guess the other difference is that all of the teaching is done from people, academic staff from the University of Sydney. It's not done by local tutors or anything like that. So all of the, the courses are taught fully by University of Sydney nursing academics. So that was a, that was a good question. I wonder if there's any others that you have. And my philosophy is that no question is a silly question. And chances are, if you have a a question in the back of your mind, other people probably would like to know the answer as well. So don't be shy. Please do um, come forward with your question. Now, good question here about COVID. 
Typically, we teach face-to-face -face in Singapore, but obviously we are amidst a pandemic at the moment and the Australian government and the Singapore government have very strict travel bans. So as much as we would like to come to Singapore and teach, we are not uh, uh, permitted to at the moment. So we are conducting our classes online, but they are live online. So we use Zoom like this and lectures will be, um, some will be recorded, all tutorials will be live, quite a lot of lectures will be live as well. And that provides you with an opportunity to ask questions as we go along. Um, we try and emulate as many interesting tutorial activities that we can online. Clearly things are a little bit different but we are getting very skilled at using quite advanced technology from a teaching perspective to engage you. So as soon as we can, we will be coming back to Singapore and teaching face-to-face. -face. We actually teach in a blended way. So um, our lectures and tutorials are in person and we supplement that with a lot of um, online learning as well. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, good question here about scholarships. Yes, the University of Sydney and Sim work in partnership and we do offer what is called an industry scholarship. So that means if you have two or more nurses from the same hospital who wish to come and do their degree and they're being sponsored, the, um, the fee is reduced by, I think it's 25%, Celine, is that correct? Yes, yep. correct. So yep. that's a big saving. And then as we said, for this year, in recognition of, of the hard work of nurses, we have reduced our fees by 10% for individuals who are perhaps self-funding. So that offers a, a nice saving or incentive. Any other questions? I think May might have answered a lot of them. She talked about the assignments and um, the classes. I'll let Celine ask, answer that one about the school fee. Yes. Um, okay, I'm just uh, doing a quick uh, pull up of the uh, total school fees. That's actually on our website. So we've got eight uh, modules and uh, each module is currently $3,050 without GST. So if you multiply that by eight, I'm just going to do a quick check so that uh, I'm getting the number correct. Uh, yeah. Jacqueline, maybe we can take the next question first. Okay, while well, well, you're doing yeah, that. Yeah. Yes, um, correct, yeah. Is the degree part-time only? No, it's not. You can choose to do your degree full-time over one year. So if you choose to start in July, which is our main intake, you can opt to do it over one year if you wish. So that's two semesters and you would be doing four subjects per semester. Most of our students do it over two years. And that, so that's over four semesters and that's two subjects per semester. And that's because the majority of our students are working as nurses. And um, um, we think that pacing themselves at that rate is probably a very good idea because they can then hang their learning on what they're doing in their everyday job. But you do have the option. We probably have maybe a 85% um, proportion of our students do it over two years and maybe 15% do it over the one year. So it's whatever suits your, your lifestyle. We would not encourage people to try and work full-time if they are studying full-time as well, because it's just a bit too demanding. How many classes a week is it fixed? That's a good question. So let's take the example of May, who studied over two Years. May, would you like to explain what the classes were like? 
Um, okay, back in my time, I hope uh, things haven't changed much yet. So um, you'll get a, a timetable before the start of your study, study term semester. And then you you have like a block of study. So either like uh, in two weeks or sometimes I think three weeks, stretch to three weeks. Then, then, then in between, you get time to do your coursework assignment and then you'll be back for exam. Or these three weeks are sometimes can be spread depending on the, the, the unit of study that you choose. Yeah. yeah. So when we are face-to-face, -face, you might have to come for um, a maximum of six weeks in the semester. Okay, but you wouldn't have to come every evening. It might be three out of the five evenings and there would be a break in between those six weeks. So you might do two weeks of one subject, then have a week's break, then do a week of another subject, have a couple of weeks break, do two weeks of that subject, and then finish the first subjects one week. And then there'll be plenty of weeks where you don't have anything, and you would be using that time to be working on your assignments. Okay, so it's not like you are studying 52 weeks of the year and have to come five nights a week. It doesn't work like that. Now, someone's asking, are the lecture notes or slides provided? Yes, we do provide access to the lecture notes on a online platform called Canvas. So if you wish to print those off and make notes, you can do yourself. We also provide access to all of the readings that you can download and um, you know, store on your computer or print them off. So you have full access to the University of Sydney Library, as well as the SIM Library and all of the other resources that other students have who are studying online. Good question here. Can I take my degree immediately after my diploma? or do I require clinical experience first? Yes, you can take your degree immediately after your, your diploma. So that's, that's absolutely fine. We got any other questions? Jacqueline, have we taken the question about the project? Um, the one that asked, um, is this project part-time? Yes, yeah. we have, we've okay. answered that one, yeah. yeah. So just to reiterate, my, my answer was no, it's not part-time only. You can choose to do it full-time over one year. I'm wondering if I could ask May, what sort of burning questions did you have, May, before you started? Um, oh, that was like quite a long time ago, so I'm just thinking... Oh, okay. I think the, the question that I had was like, um, I heard that it's, it's, uh, it's the toughest of the, the part-time courses that's available in Singapore. So I had the question to myself about myself, whether can I make it? Yeah. So I think I, I had gone through something like this kind of a session also, but of course that time was face-to-face. -face. So there was also someone sharing about her experience. And then at the time, I think it was uh, Stuart, I think. Yeah. Yes. So um yeah that, that was quite encouraging where I I I I met the lecturer and then I I felt like okay it, it's very approachable so I think I can rely on my lecturers so that's where I I got to it yeah. Thank you May. That's probably another point of differentiation between um our program and some of the other programs that are run in Singapore and that's the level of student support that's provided. So May already mentioned that, you know, students can simply email their lecturer or make an appointment to see them um, if they've got questions about assignments or if they're not fully understanding a concept that we went through in class. And everyone is very approachable. So the Singapore teaching team have been selected for a reason, and that's because of their teaching ability as well as their, their subject expertise. So you're getting taught by real experts in the field who know how to educate as well. Um, but there's also a range of facilities at SIM that are open to you that provide support. So the Learning Centre, for example, 
can help with academic writing. There's also the Student Welfare Centre, as I said, the library and the librarians, and you have access to um, library resources at the University of Sydney, which the majority are now are available electronically. So you don't have to buy textbooks anymore. They're, the textbooks that we prescribe are typically online and you get access to those as part of your student enrolment. Now, here's a good question. What's the lecturer tutor to student ratio? That's, that's a very interesting question. We don't have huge, huge, big classes. We have classes that are manageable um, and every academic gets to know um, the students. So it depends each year our enrolment numbers change really. But at the moment we have um, lectures and they would be everyone in a, a unit of study and it might be 60 or 65 students. And then our tutorials are smaller. So we might have a tutorial of maybe 20 whereby you really have a, an opportunity to interact and discuss and speak with not only your, your lecturer, but also your colleagues. So um, that's what we have at the moment. So we, we don't subscribe to having huge big classes that are very impersonable, um, impersonal. We um, have those types of numbers. Now, what are the admission requirements? Oh, these will all be on, on the website, but if I can remember them, you need to have, um, you need to be a registered nurse. You need to be um, registered with Singapore Nurses Board and you need to meet the English language proficiency. So if you've done your diploma in Singapore, that, that counts for that. So if you have a look on, we can send you a web link there will be information about the admission requirements, but we don't use any um, scoring system. And I always forget what the scoring system is called, Celine. Some of the other universities require a minimum GPA. We don't require that. So it's really just the fact that you meet the English language requirements, you are a registered nurse in Singapore and um, you're registered with the Singapore Nurses Board. Ryan's got a good question here. Will there be group work presentations involved as well? Yes, we use a broad range of assessment strategies and each unit will be assessed in different ways. So we use things like individual reports or essays, group work, um, group presentations, individual presentations, but some innovative things as May has alluded to. So that could be um, you know, a, a poster or a, um, a case study. At the moment, we don't have any formal exams. We have online quizzes. So we use a broad range of different things. And that's because we are aware that students learn in different ways and therefore they need to be assessed in different ways as well. Well, here's a question. What if I fail a module, can I retake it? Yes, you can. Um, our modules, or we call them units of study, but another name would be a module or subject. We offer them all once a year. And if you fail, you can take it again at a reduced rate, but most of our students don't fail, the majority pass. So it's very few students who fail. And I think that's reflective of the support that's provided. Now, I need to fulfill my two years national service, which begins this year. May I know if it's possible to reserve a vacancy in the one year program in 2023? Celine, you're probably well positioned to answer that one. Yeah, yeah. so we currently um, do not have this concept of reserving a place. I think this is because there could be updates subsequently to admission criteria or fees. So uh, for Ming Tian, I think you will probably have to come back to us again sometime when you have completed your national service to make an application for our program at that time. Yeah. We have quite a lot of people, well, yeah, 
everyone has to do national service in <laughs> Singapore. I was just about to say, we have a lot of our, our males who have done national service. <laughs> but of course, that's a silly comment on my part. <laughs> Anything else? If I want to apply for a master's after graduation, should I apply for the degree of the University of Sydney or the SIMs? So just, just so it's clear with everyone, the University of Sydney and Singapore Institute of Management are in partnership, okay? We work together, but the degree comes from the University of Sydney, so it's not an SIM degree. It's a University of Sydney degree. So yes, having a degree from the University of Sydney would be a requirement if you wanted to then go on and, and do higher degree research studies such as a master's. So the answer would be to Sherry, yes. There's been some really good questions yeah. come out this afternoon. Yeah. So I can tell that everyone's engaged and interested, perhaps. Has anyone put in a, an application yet? You could use the reaction button at the bottom of the screen to put up your thumb up if you have put in an application or if anyone's considering putting in an application. Oh. <laughs> Wonderful, Thank Ryan. <laughs> well, I look forward to seeing you. So people might be wondering, when do classes start? So we have two intakes per year. Our main intake we call a July intake and we have two days of orientation. It's not two full days, it's two dates where we do orientation and they will be the week of the 2nd of August, I think, this year. And that's just reminded me, Nation National Singapore Day is the... What the date? Of August. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then our classes will start the next week. But of course, we don't run classes on public holidays, so you will be getting that day off. People might be thinking, well, when is the closing date for the applications? And we are, um, it was originally set early June, but the yep. year's running away from us so quickly that we have, have put that back to, I think, the 23rd of June. But my advice to everyone is if you are interested and you want to put an application in, put it in now and secure your place. And then we can start the enrollment process and you can start looking at those, some of those learning materials in preparation. Oh, uh, may I know how the honours program works? Now that's a very good question as well. So unlike other degree programs, we don't have an embedded honours. It's not part of our post-registration degree. And that's because we believe that honours is very much a research training degree. So for students, once they've finished their degree, they can apply for a second program, which is a Bachelor of Nursing honours degree. And as part of that, you would receive individual supervision from two academics at Sydney Nursing School who will be um, supervising you or guiding you to do an independent research project. So you'd work right through the research process, including the ethics application if that's required, to um, recruiting participants, to collecting data, analysing the data, and then writing that up. So that's quite a, well, it's a, you know, really good preparation for students who want to go on and do a, a master's or a PhD. So it's a more traditional research-based honours program rather than one of 
the ones that's like an embedded literature review or something like that. And the beauty of the honours program at the offered by Sydney Nursing School is that it really does prepare you for a career in research. And um, most of our students get at least one or two publications out of it, which really helps to strengthen um, further applications for more study and looks wonderful on your CV as well if you are going for um, higher level jobs. Uh, just wondering, is the, is the grading bell curved? No, we don't use bell curves. We don't moderate. So the grade is what you get, okay? Um, we have a system whereby you will get a mark for each assignment. And in order to pass the module, you just need to get a mark of 50, okay? So 50 is what we regard as a pass mark, 50 out of 100. And then we would um, give your overall mark for the module a grade, and that would be from pass to high distinction. So we don't manipulate any of the marks so that it goes in a bell curve. Um, you know, if we have a very bright class of students, many of them will be getting distinctions and high distinctions. We don't um, change it at all. Good question, that one. Is there anything else people would like to know? Now's your opportunity. So anything whatsoever that you might be curious about, you can ask Celine, May or myself while we're here. Will there be any overseas attachments? No, there won't be actually. We don't have overseas attachments. There's no clinical practice associated with this degree. Um, we are very cognizant that you are already registered nurses. So we don't ask you to do any practicums or work placements. Um, however, if you choose, you can come to Australia to the beautiful University of Sydney to graduate in our wonderful um, Great Hall, which is that very Harry Potterish looking building that I showed you on my title slide. And when it's not a pandemic, and hopefully by the time you graduate, in fact, I'm sure of it, travel restrictions will be lifted. And if you choose to, you can come and graduate in Sydney. And often that's a really good incentive for people to work hard. They bring their families with them um, and they have a bit of a mini holiday while they're here. But of course, you can also graduate in Singapore, um, which makes it easier for some family members to get to. And we have a wonderful celebration, don't we, May, when people graduate? Yeah, we <laughs> can. <laughs> very special occasion and it's often followed by a, an alumni event at the Australian um, High Commissioner's residence in Singapore where because you're a graduate of the University of Sydney you are invited to come and that's often quite a fancy way of ending a very special day. Lynn, can you see any more questions or have I missed um, any? Yeah, I'm just scanning through to make sure we haven't missed out any. I think we have done very good questions this afternoon, Jacqueline. Yes. Uh, yes, there's a question about whether the fees listed includes GST. So yes, the current amount that has been listed includes GST. Yeah. 
And they don't have to outlay the whole fee at once, do they, Celine? Uh, yeah, no. So you basically pay per enrollment of a subject. So if you choose to enroll in two subjects for that semester, you would just basically have to make payment only for that two uh, units of study. So in total, there's eight units of study. Um, we give you credit for your diploma level studies. So you get a degree based on eight modules rather than what is typically 24. Okay, we'll just probably just give um, a last few minutes or so for anyone to put in any last questions. I've really enjoyed speaking to everyone this afternoon. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed my presentation. And next time you see an image of a nurse that doesn't reflect reality, think about the impact of that. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, if there are no more questions for this moment, we'll probably bring this session to a close, but you're always welcome to email us any questions after this, if anything comes to mind. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, thank Jacqueline and May to be with us this afternoon and uh, to all of you for spending your time with us as well. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Selena. Thank you, May. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.